If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This has been another episode sponsored by Online Horse College. If you haven't had a look at the wide variety of equine-specific accredited courses, then go to onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Our guest today is Sky Wanzi. Sky's got a dressage show jumping and eventing background. She's been a competitor, trainer and coach, and she's also got a racehorse trainer's license now. She uses a common sense approach to horse and horsemanship with the students. How are you today, Sky? Yeah, I'm good. I'm very good. Thank you. Good. Sky, your favourite quote. Tell us about that one. Okay, make the right things comfortable and the wrong things difficult. Mm -hmm. It's huge for me, this quote. It comes originally from Tom Dorrance, uh, an American horseman, Um, but I heard it for the first time from Ray Hunt, one of Tom's students who I studied with. What, What it means is a horse just wants to be comfortable. Um, if it's doing the right thing, make it comfortable so she knows that she's doing the right thing. If she's not doing the right thing, make it difficult. So if you want a horse to walk and not jig jog, make the jig jogging very uncomfortable and quite difficult for the horse. You know, bounce around and, and, and you know, uh, unsteady with your hands. And it's uncomfortable for the horse. As soon as that mare comes back to a walk, you might offer that spot for her to come back. You make it, you you sit deep and calm and, and then you may even rub her a bit. But basically, good. The comfort, she'll learn it's easier and more comfortable to to do the right thing rather than the wrong thing. Yep, yep. yep. And you use this when you teach your own students? Yeah, I do. I mm-hmm. do because um, I can even use it with, you can use it in your whole life, like for dogs, yes, for kids, yes. for Yes, I do. It's very important that um, my students, the people who come to me to learn how to work with horses uh, more confidently, learn that uh, if the horse is in their space, they need to make it uncomfortable for the horse so the horse will back up and get out of the space so the horse is safe and the person is safe. If you just let the horse walk all over you, someone is going to get hurt, probably the the human Mm. and then the horse. So. I don't want the horse to keep getting blamed, so I set it up so the students can stand and hold a horse, but the horse has got its own responsibility. She must be able to stand a metre or so away from you and not on top of you. When you're in a lead class, of course, you're going to be standing right next to the horse so the judge can look at it, but you don't want the horse pushing you and nudging you. See, people allow their horses to treat them like posts. I don't. A horse is a horse and I am the leader of that relationship. So I don't like to be a post. I do not want my horse rubbing on me. I will scratch my horse. But if it takes over and gets too rough, I make it uncomfortable for the horse. I scratch it and I maybe make it too rough and it'll go, oh, I don't like this post. Yep, yep, yep. Sky, tell us about one of your early memories when you first started with horses. Were you young when you started with horses? Did your family have horses? I was, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was inside yeah. my mother's womb. I don't remember that. But <laughs> she played polo cross with me until she was like nearly eight months old, uh, until, until she was eight months pregnant. Yeah. So we were, I was one of seven kids and she rode all the time. Okay. So we all had ponies from the time we could walk. Um, and... Yeah, I remember I remember trying to get up that front leg. I have a very strong memory of um getting getting it together to climb up the front leg to get my foot or knee actually it was then into the stirrup. How old were you then? Oh, I must have been mm, I must have been 3 or 4. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's and- the, probably the earliest thing I remember. Yeah. Did you, you know, because I've seen people do that, did you get shown that technique? Did you see one of the other kids do it? I think, I think when you're just left in, you know, it was, it was different back then, wasn't it, in the 60s. I think um, 
our parents were probably more lax with the kids. So you're probably more... I wouldn't say neglect. Yeah, probably more neglected or you could take more risks with kids back then than today. You can't be so free and say, okay, honey, I'm just going to go and change the nappy inside on another baby and you kids will just be out here with your ponies. I would never have really left my children alone or your children alone with their ponies while I left. But I think it was so, that's what we did in the country. We all had ponies. And I suppose getting on the horse, I would have seen both people getting on correctly as my mother would have, um, or I would have seen maybe my older sister or my brother um, getting a leg up and I have to maybe beat him on, so I had to try and work out how to get on. I, maybe I saw people standing in wheelbarrows and trying to get on or on a fence. So I think it was probably a creative way yep. um, that I learned to get on. And I was very strong because the upper body has to be so strong when you're, when you're pulling yourself up. Um, and and also carrying buckets, I noticed that I had very big arms from a very early <laughs> age from from working around horses, you know, yeah. even picking their feet is a, is a heavy-duty job for a kid, you know. And then from that, you know, because you've gone on to compete, to become yeah. a qualified coach, to now become a racehorse trainer, were you always going to do something with horses? You know, was there ever a time where you thought, I'm not going to have horses in my life, or were they always going to? have horses in your life. Yeah. I did try to give up horses yep. um, I, and I did I did stop riding for four years. So if I have, um, I've probably been riding, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I've probably been riding over 50 years. Mm-hmm. So I've had four years off in okay. my life and I okay. probably had the, the first two or three off, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I did think that I'd give them up because it was very depressing not being able to get a horse to do things like say I got into show jumping and camp drafting and I was a show rider and I did every single thing that you could do I'd whiz out of the riding you know um girl rider class and go and jump you know uh a show jumping course on the same horse that I was hacking you know so we did everything and um I think that I got to a point where I was show jumping and I was jumping bigger and bigger fences and sometimes I would be at home flogging my horses to get over bigger fences and I'd go to bed at night thinking I hate that horse and uh, that horse didn't, wouldn't, you know, the last horse I rode out of the 10 or 12 because I would ride so many horses every day, that's all I did. Um, uh, the last horse, if the last, if my night depended on how well the last horse went. If the last horse really was, you know, not doing what I wanted and I couldn't get it to go over the creek or I couldn't get it to jump a metre 30 or whatever I wanted it to do, I would be uh, angry. And um, it wasn't until I had a real, I think, a spiritual awakening when I heard about Ray Hunt, when I actually gave up because I couldn't sleep at night because of what I was doing to horses, which is what I learned from my breaking in and trainers that, I mean, we didn't have lessons back then, but but I saw how the men treated the horses. They were tough on them, you know, mm. and I learned and I had to be tougher than them because I was a young girl and I left school at 15 and, and um, I had to be better than them. And so I was very tough and strong and, you know, we, we spider hobbled our horses to get on and off them when we were breaking them in because they were so afraid, those horses, from what the men were doing to them. Um It was such a tough life being a show jump rider um, when you didn't, you know, when you had to train horses to do that on your own that you kind of would, I don't want to say I would beat them up, but there was an aggression and an ego and a a, I'll make you get on that truck no matter what. You know, there was that sort of attitude. Well, I didn't want that anymore. I didn't sleep well with that stuff, you know. I saw people doing terrible things to horses, you know, same as show jumpers. I just saw terrible, terrible things, and I thought, I don't want to be doing this to horses. I, this is not what I want. So mm. I gave up, and uh, did. I, I'm an actor as well, and I did theatre, and I did some film, and I went away and, and lived overseas for four years. And then when I came back, I stepped up onto this horse, and um, I had read a lot about, yeah, um, this other technique, and that was it. I just, um, from that moment on, I rarely competed. 
Um, I think I took 20 years off out of the show ring and uh, did not compete again. And I worked horses every day and and uh, taught. And and then uh, my whole my whole life changed. It was a life changing event. And now I don't have to beat horses up. I can communicate with horses on a much different level. There's no ego. It's just a much easier, more beautiful way. And I really adore working with my horses. I still start horses, which is means breaking. I got a new one yesterday. He's a twelve hand stallion and um uh pony you know, the ponies come in and I work with them and, you know, they're biters and they're whatever else and they can go home and have a really nice life, you know. And I have had no sleep loss because I work with them and they're happy and I'm happy. Yep. So my whole life changed when I when I started doing this other technique. Was that Ray Hunt or you'd just been reading what, you know? I understand why you wanted to get away from the previous technique, but what got you started on the more gentler approach? I watched a friend of mine start a mare of my mother's um, that we'd bred, Mm -hmm. and my mum was still breeding Australian stock horses, and um, I had left the family business, and I said, I'm not doing it anymore. I'm not breaking any more horses, and see you later. And when I came back, she said, could you do me a favour and run this mare out to Duncan Gavin's place? And um, I said, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. So I dropped her out there, and I stayed the, I stayed for three days, and I watched him start this mare from she, – she'd been to a couple of shows anyway, so she'd been a um, two-year-old filly led in Australian stock horse classes. So she was fairly quiet, but I had never seen anything like it. And he, he was like – you know, he just was riding her that afternoon and, and uh, he mailed her on the back, no driving. And it just was so incredible. That was it. I became completely obsessed with it. I became completely passionate about it. I went home. I got two colts out of the paddock um, and uh, I rang him every day and I started those two horses. And then I entered them into a three-year-old futurity um, three months later after starting them over the phone via correspondence with this Duncan Gavin. And um, they were both, you know, they both did these beautiful workouts in the stock horse futurity up there at Dubbo. And it was incredible. I suppose I suppose that just changed everything I did. And then from there I just went on and, and, and rode and, and started horses like this and got horses out of the sale yard and tried to fix them up and give them a new life. And, and I taught my students like that. Once I went to do my equestrian thing, mm. I had to um, work with Simon Kale and do all the uh, EA exams and stuff like that. But I incorporated my stuff with it. So I'm technically, I'm technically aware of, you know, Equestrian Australia's rules and, and, and the way we do things, but I also have this other side to to um, working with horses. So It sounds like you've been getting some great results anyway, so, you know, you're doing things and you're um, working along the right lines with the horses, yeah. Well, I, I change horses' lives. Like, I, I get horses that are on their way out, they've done the show, you know, they've won at Melbourne Royal and they have been going around and around in circles for 12 years and they're sick of it and they're pig rooting and they're saying, I don't want to do any more workouts. And there's nowhere for those horses to go. They may have once been sold for 12 or 15,000. Now they're worth nothing, Mm. you know, because they can ride them around the arena. So I get them and I keep them for two or three years and they walk around my property with me doing my horsemanship stuff on it. And then they go back into the show ring or they go back into show jumping or another career starts up for them because they get, they get understood and, and I can change their life. Yeah. And that's better than them going to the knackers, you know, for me, it's huge. Mm. So that's what I love doing. If you want to teach someone else, say someone else wants to learn the same techniques and they come in and they say, look, can you teach me everything you know? What sort of core skills or character traits do you think they need before they even get started with you? Well, I guess they have to be, for me, I was so passionate. I traveled all over, you know, I went, I went around the world looking for the teachers. So I was so passionate that I saved all my money to go and 
live with these people and, and work with these people. And then I found an Australian instructor who did the same thing, Phil Rohde. And so I worked out, I had my own Ray Hunt in the backyard here. And um, I worked a lot with Phil. And every time Ray would come out, he's dead now, but um, every time Ray would come, I'd still go to his clinics. And then Buck Brenneman learnt from Ray Hunt and Tom Dorrance and Bill Dorrance. So now I can go and sit on the fence and watch Buck. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I get a student, it's so rare that they want it so bad. What most kids want and most, what most people want when they start riding, they want instant success and they're not prepared on doing. They are not prepared to do the work you have to do to get this. I mean, I'm up to 25, 30, I'm probably 30 years of horsemanship now yep. and, you know, thousands and thousands of hours, I guess. I've had students that say they want it, but you say to them, I want you to walk on that horse for six months mm. and two weeks later they're cantering. Yep. They can't walk for six mm. months because they don't have the dedication. But then again, if you've only got one horse, I understand you, you want a canter, of course. But most people, if you say this horse needs walking for six months, they can't do it they, because they couldn't be bothered. They, they, they want the human. They want the human ego. They want to canter around. They want to win the blue ribbon. I couldn't care less about a blue ribbon. It means nothing. It's just another person's opinion of me and my horse. I couldn't care less about what you think of me and my horse. But I know when my horse has done the right thing. The thing is students need to really want and be really prepared to know they know nothing. And that was a really hard thing for me. I cried myself to sleep. I would go places. I went to the States and worked over there. And I realized that I really, even though I'd been competitive all my life and won lots of champion girl riders and champion lady riders and won camp drafts and steer undecorating and all that at rodeos and stuff, I didn't know so much, yet I thought I was so good. It was such a deflation of ego, but I had to get to the point where I was basically broken and I was ready to be a blank canvas and say, I don't know how to do this. Mm-hmm. When yep. they said to me, someone to put a halter on, I thought, oh, who can't put a bloody halter on? But I realized what they, they were doing. They were, I realized that the horse, I wasn't even connected with the horse. I was just getting the horse, somehow catching that mad horse in the yard and putting a halter on it, you know. I didn't get the horse to want to be with me at all. If you gave the horse a choice, it probably wouldn't have wanted to be caught by me the next day, you know. Mm, it's interesting. Mm. My horses come up to me now. They they all just walk over and say, oh, are you going to catch me, you know. Yep. Whereas yep. in the old days, I was I was cornering horses, to be really honest, mm. you know. Mm. But if you punched a horse in the nose the day before, why would it want to be caught? Or if you went around in circles for two hours because it wasn't doing its canter change nicely enough, but you went around and around and around and around and around and around a circle, 20-metre circle, why would it want to be caught tomorrow? Yep, yep. You know, um, I like finishing on a nice note, and so my horses, as soon as they get that cantilever, get off them. I yep. go, that's it. And the horse will learn, oh, my God, that's it. That's what she wants. And, yeah, it's beautiful, but it's not for everyone because it is uh, it is a dedication um, and a commitment and a passion. And I've gotten rid of students because they don't have it. They want to tie their mouths, mouths shut and they want to, you know, I'm not into that. I'm into working out why does that horse open its mouth when we ask it to stop? Don't just tie the nose band tighter. Sometimes I'll ask a student, what, when I'm judging, I don't really judge now, but when I'm judging, I say, why does that horse have a nose band on, like a, a tight cross nose band on? And she'll say, oh, I don't know. Um, we just It was on the bridle when we got it. Yep, yep. Wait, can you hear anything? No. That's because we're waiting for someone with a good quality horse product to be advertised here. If that's you, then contact us. Horse chats at horsechats.com and we'll send you the details. Thanks. What do you think's the best thing about working with the horses and working in the industry? The horse. 
Mm-hmm. The horse is the best thing. Oh my yep. God, the yep. horse is so. It, the horse is so spiritually present. The horse. I might sound wacky, but I. If without horses, I shrivel up. My soul dies. I love horses so much that. When I'm in the yard with a horse, and I can only really work with, you know, one or two horses at once, but when I'm in the yard or riding a horse and I'm connected, I can't think of anything else. There is, I'm actually, it's the, the best thing about horses is they force you to be in the present. Anything else I can think about other things. If I'm cooking, I can think about the washing hanging up. If I'm watching a movie, I can think, oh, God, I've got to go and turn that tap off. But when I'm in a yard with a horse and I'm connecting with the horse, I can't think of anything else. Yep, yep. It's a very humbling experience being heard by a horse or hearing a horse and no one's speaking here. I can hear... Or I can I can see a horse that is working around me in a round yard, and I know it's never been heard. It's got the the, the roller doors down. It is shut off, and people go, "Oh, he's really stubborn. He's not scared. He's petrified. He's never been heard in his life, and he's just going. He's just trying to do the right thing, not to get you know his head cut off." So I think the most the best thing about the horse industry is the horses. Yep, and it's the the willingness for people like me, I guess to understand them and maybe speak for them because, yeah, they're, they're wonderful animals. And, gee, they make me feel if I get, de- you know, if I've ever been depressed or – and they're using them a lot now for therapy and stuff. And, and I went and did a course on that as a student, as a um, – not as a coach, but as a person enrolling in the therapy for mm-hmm. me yes. to go. And they said – It makes no difference. In fact, it'll hinder you the more experience you've had with horses because you'll think you know what you're going to do and stuff. And I just had to drop everything that I knew and I had to get in this yard with these horses and um, try and hear what the therapist who knew nothing about horses was saying. And it was so moving. The horses are very deep uh, emotional things that, that I get a lot out of. Yep. Yeah. Now, Sky, you talked about Duncan and said he had quite a big influence, but who else would you say as being influential? Well, Duncan Gavin grew up in the um, pony club system. Um, his mother was a vet, his father was a um, camp drafter, po- they were all polo cross players, and he had five brothers and sisters who, you know, fantastic riders. But... Um, he went out and learnt this new technique and got hooked on um, doing this horsemanship stuff like Ray Hunt and, and just started, you know, starting all their horses like that. And it made a huge difference to the um, to the Gavin's horses um, from then on for many generations. But um, Phil Rohde, uh, Phil Rohde, I guess he was a quarter horse man, but really he was like the Australian, he is the Australian version of Ray Hunt. Um, and of course, uh, I guess the, the one now is Buck Branham and, and, and Ray Hunt and Tom Dorrance. But there's been wonderful other people in the industry. You know, even Simon Cale is one of the people that I would ring because he knows my staff and he knows I'm not a crackpot and he believes in me. And I'll ring him and I will discuss things with him. And, um, Tony Norman is another one that I consider to be a great teacher, but really the real teacher that gave me everything that I needed to have this incredibly rich life of abundance with horses and be able to have them in my life every single day and uh, is my mother. Okay. And uh, Jenny Wansby, you know, is a fourth generation. She's a Rouse and 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 my great grandfather owned the racehorse Jorix, and he bought him for um, three heifers. It, it cost him three mm-hmm. heifers. And that horse Jorix, if you look up, um, in fact, I'm, I'm going to see if I can call my property Jorix Lodge because the race industry, you know, and Huey Bowman is my cousin. So my mother's first cousin is Huey Bowman's father. Okay. So I've got this uh, horse. You know, there's a long line of really great horsemen. Richard Rouse, when he came, you know, 
came over from England, he was a an incredibly, I guess, a wealthy uh, racehorse owner. And uh, in those days, I mean, giving three heifers for a horse doesn't sound much, but <laughs> I guess back in those days it was a lot. And yes. Huey Bowman's just bought the property that my mother grew up on. So, yeah, it's all very, it's all coming back. I mean, it's, I guess, my mother and, and my grandfather, Richard Rouse, mm-hmm. really were a huge in my, I mean, I've raced camels and um, I've ridden every type of horse you could imagine. And I rode for TJ Smith for a long time when I was, you know, when I was living in Sydney when I was a drama student. So yep. I've kind of done most things, but I would always ring my mom and say, guess how I loaded a horse today or, mm-hmm. you know, yes. you yes. know, I would tell her. I miss her. I miss her. She died last year. I miss her. I miss telling her the things because she was, that's how we connected through yep. horses. Yep. What about a horse you think that's influenced you? Have you got a horse who you think's influenced you or there have been a couple of horses? Yeah, my horse Spider, he was a horse that uh, I did the hours on. The horse, the one horse that I have spent, you know those horses that you just pick and then yes. they are the horses that you spend every day. And I follow the, the line like, Lay yourself a line, Tom used to say, like draw a line on the ground and stay on that line. And the only time you have to touch your horse is if she's off the line. Well, your horse will see that line. It won't be an imaginary line because if you draw that line with your eyes and you look in front of you and you see that line, your horse will eventually see it. Well, I can tell you now that Spider was the first horse that I can say saw that line. And that was from hours and hours of being with that horse and seeing that line and doing exactly what my coach, uh, Phil Rohde, told me to do and all those guys told me to do. And I followed that. And he won so many champions. I mean, I could just go to any show and he would win best or champion working Australian stock horse. At every ag show he would go to, I had never won so many broad ribbons. This horse was, you know, of course I didn't win the champion working horse at Sydney show. That's top, you know, top dog. But he did get, you know, he did was always in the lineup for the station horse. He, uh, you know, he would win at Sydney the fifth and sixth, I think. He won every year in his station horse that I went there. Um, I didn't compete that much, really. I just would do a couple of ag shows. But this horse was, wherever I looked, he could go there. Yep, yep. So I guess you never get 100% trust from a horse, but I reckon that this horse, was I could ride him through any dark, small area. They say you can't get 100% trust, but, gee, that's the closest I've ever <laughs> got to that trust with that horse, that he trusted me. What do you think your proudest moment then was that with Spider? Yeah, I guess I guess riding at a um, at a um, a field day. I did an exhibition once, and I rode him bridleless, and it was like working with. It was just I knew that all that work that I had done was there to see, and it didn't matter what anyone at the field day thought. Obviously, they thought. You know, this horse was amazing. But it really was not necessarily, for me, the horse. It was the fact that when you do your homework, you get the results and the dedication that I put into it. I guess that makes me feel really, I've worked very hard at this. Yep. 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 And I'm going to continue doing it. And I've got a racehorse now and I'm spending that time because – I want them to, I want to understand what's going on for you, Big Red. Like, I need to know how he's, kind of how he's feeling. Like, um, because he's going to be doing things that are so, you know, to race in a race, he has to be feeling and fit so well. Um, so conditioning horses are really exciting for me. So, and I'm driving, I'm driving horses. So I've got, rescue trotters that I'm 
I put in the cart and now I'm training my trotting horses to lead my working horses. So now I'm <laughs> driving around static in my trotting um, gig yep. and I'd like to say that the best teacher for my trotting, uh, for my harness yes. is uh, a guy, an old guy who's just had his leg cut off yesterday, um, my friend War- Warren, um, oh my God, I've just had a mental block. Um, <laughs> Oh, my God, I've forgotten Warren's last name. That's terrible. But Warren is uh, a true horseman like that, that what I'm talking yes. about. But it's yes. In, uh, it's, um, so uh, what do you call it? Um, joggers, in joggers. Yep. Yep. And they complete in those. I, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, Rickett, his name is Warren Rickett. And he's very famous in the, in the uh, equestrian world. And he judges everywhere. He's just had his leg cut off in the hospital in Sydney. God bless him. I'll go up and see him next week. But he's taught me to do the horsemanship stuff in the in the jogger. Yep. So now I've got a res- an old rescue trotter, black mare called uh, Charlie, and now I'm getting I'm getting off my racehorses back sort of three days a week, and he's getting conditioned by this mare. So they're trotting along together in the jogger. Okay. Like, so I'm incorporating everything that I know because I get bored. And so I move from camp drafting to show jumping to, you know, um, I did eventing for a while and then now I'm in the jogger. So <laughs> I'm never going to be a, I'm never going to be a trotting driver. Believe yep. me, yep. I will, never, as far as I know, I will never get that opportunity because I think that that is something I would have had to be doing for a very long time. And I will, probably never be a jockey Mm -hmm. but those you know those things and I will of course never go to the Olympics or anything like that but that wasn't my path but now I'm working with these horses at home and I live with my horses like I've attached the stables to the house so I will I can stand at the laundry door and open my laundry door and it's it goes into the stables okay so I live I I'm in with the horses and uh that's really exciting for me, you know, to to be in my last sort of twenty years of my life, <laughs> and and I can see them from every window of the house in the yeah. paddock. So yeah. it's like I I see their herd herd behaviour, and um, yeah, it's really I feel very lucky. You know, that's my only work. When you talked earlier on, you talked about the riders just wanting the instant success, but. Just generally when you're coaching them, what's a common fault that you see? You know, not necessarily everyone wants instant success, but something you'd go in and start teaching and say, right, we'll try this, try that. What what do you see? The the common thing is there's no feel. Like the the most important thing, and and, um, in fact, maybe, uh, maybe one of my mottos is feel, timing and balance. Okay. So... What's happening is you're getting these kids coming. You know, I see a four-year-old kid and he's got the position, but he's got no feel. Whereas when my when my students come to me, for whatever reason they're coming, um, they're all in the right gear. They've got the chapettes on and the right nice jotties and the nice vests, but they can't hear their horses. So the horse is doing stuff, but the person is not aware how to get the horse to do things from feel, like mm-hmm. one step at a time. Yes. Um, yeah, it's all about um, on the bit. Like, forget about on the bit. You know, I want to get the bit out of the horse's mouth. The horse the horse goes on the bit naturally in the paddock. You see it, right? Yep. But the kids today, the 14-year-olds and stuff, does he go on the bit? Well, you know, I don't even know if they know what that means, but... There seems to have to be a lot of contact with horses to get them to do anything. But a, a black fly can move a horse. Mm. Yes. You know, a black fly yes. can get a horse to lift its leg up or to, sh- to, to, to move its shoulder. Why would I need a great big leg pushing a horse over and a spur and a, maybe a whip at the other end? Why do I need that to get the horse to move over? Why can't I get the same pressure? My idea is to get the students to take, not take the leg off, but just be aware how sensitive the horse is. A black fly can move a horse, so why does it take so much energy to pull the bloody horse up? 
Mm. Why is it taking two arms, like pulling? There's something wrong. And so I would like to get them to be able to ride with less contact. Be safe in my arena, but be able to sit down, stop riding and have the horse just pull up. Yeah. No pulling, let the reins go. In fact, get rid of the reins. And um, yeah, and I and I find that uh, they're just all smiles. So both of them, the horse and the person, will become all smiles when they connect on that level. That you yep. don't need to be. Well, I don't know. They say weird things like hold him up with your inside leg. How the hell am I going to hold up? A, <laughs> how's an eight-year-old kid going to hold up a? ton of horse or something with their inside leg, the horse should have more responsibility, I think, and hold itself up. But, um, yeah, you know what I mean. I, yeah. I would like to just get my students to feel more. And when I do camps, which I do quite, you know, I do regular camps, um, then they start getting it. It's no good coming an hour a week. I don't think you can get it. I think okay. you need, I think they need I think they need to be in the saddle on a couple of different horses at my place six hours a day so that they, they, they're there for the shaking, they're there for the, you know, head going down, they're there for the whole experience of just being on a horse. I think that's what makes us good is just being on the horse. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. Sky, have you got a book that you can recommend to complement some training? Well, the only book that that I – I mean, you'd never understand True Unity with Horses from Tom Dorrance. They'd never understand that but um, because it's a whole other language. But, um, no, I – we, we can use that one if you like, the true unity with horses, because I'm sure some listeners would be interested in that, maybe not have read it. And, uh, you know, I just think it's one that people can look at anyway. And it's one that I'm just not sure if we've had it before, but I'd like to put it in our book list. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Look, there's a book um, that Bill Dorrance wrote, and uh, that's Tom Dorrance's brother, and um, it was a picture book as well. So there were pictures in it of how to do things. And I found that as a – because a lot of us, don't forget, there's a lot of illiterate people in this world. People don't know it. But if we're not very good readers, it's very hard to read a book like True Unity. It's very hard for, for people to read literature. Like I think the picture book – of, of Bill Dorrance, um, and I can't remember what it's called. Um, it's a, I'll tell you who the authors of this book is, Leslie Desmond and Bill Dorrance. Okay. Now, I don't know if you can find, but they wrote it together. So a young woman fell in love with the whole technique of Bill Dorrance, who is the same as Tom, but brothers, and uh, she went about photographing him. And the whole book, I've lost mine, but I must have lent it to someone. And the whole book, you probably get it on Amazon, yep. is a picture explanation of the bend. See, the one rain stop is the most important, moving the hindquarters. The engine is in the hindquarters. And what most people don't realize is if you can disengage those hindquarters, we've got a lot more control over these horses that are rearing or trying to piss off or you know, um, so this book explains what that means. Get your one rain stop. The first thing my students learn when they get to my into my property, into my uh, arena, is a one rain stop, because they ain't going anywhere outside my gate without having a one rain stop. It is the only way you can stop a horse that takes over or braces or bolts or anything like that. Yep. Yep. The one yeah. rain stop is probably the most important thing. If I can't bend a horse for someone, if I'm if I'm going to go, go riding at your place and you say, oh, you can ride that chestnut horse over there, I go over and I bend that horse. And I say to my students and my own children, do never get on another person's horse unless you can bend that head around to your knee. So you can dismount whenever you need to. Mm-hmm. Um, scary thing having a horse bolting. Um, <laughs> anyway, that I think Leslie Desmond and Bill Dorrance wrote this book. And um, it's fabulous. I can't remember what it's called, though. And remember, you can find all the books recommended by our guests at horsechats.com slash books.
You can have a look at the guest page for the individual book they recommended or just look at the recommended books by order of popularity at horsechats.com slash books. Sky, what are you looking forward to at the moment? Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited about Big Red. Um, my, my Mop the Floor, his name is. He's my first racehorse. And uh, I've just put him in training and uh, I'm riding on the track with him. And I'm so excited about getting to meet a jockey that I can work with that um, what I'm doing with Big Red is I'm changing the way he thinks. So every time he goes to the track, uh, he thinks he's got a gallop and I'm rearranging his mind. So now he never walked to the racetrack and he never walked home from the racetrack like he would jig jog the whole way now we get him off the trailer we walk down to the track we trot and can around the track and we walk home again so it's all changing now with big red and i'm looking forward to the time when he's jumping out of those gates and uh going in a race and 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 yeah i mean i'm so excited about being a racehorse trainer and getting mm. my next mm. horse, you know. Mm. So I've got a team of racehorses. Yeah, that's that sounds wonderful. And they all do they all do horsemanship at home. So yep. Yep. he's the most beautiful horse to ride, and I put my saddle on him, and off I go, and <laughs> I can open the gates on him, and he just lives a normal life, but he happens to be a racehorse. Yeah, yeah. So his whole life has changed. I'm sure that's a great environment for him too. You know, to just live a normal life, but still have the fitness and the training of a racehorse. Um, but go yeah. out and do the variety of things that you'd be doing with him. Yeah. 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 yeah I think he, he, he gets, uh, because, you know, horses used to have jobs to do and now they don't have any jobs. And horses used to be delivering the milk and plowing fields and, you know, going to get the cattle in or going to pick up, you know, the milk from the mail from down at the, you know, so horses had jobs to do all the time. I grew up with a greengrocer arriving with the horse and cart, you know. Um, that's all gone now. Mm, mm. There's no jobs for horses. So we've got to give them jobs to do. Yep. You've got to tie them up. You can't just let them stand around all day bored. Yep. They've got to, you know, with balls to play with. I mean, for me, this is my point of view. You know, they need jobs to do. So so I think that getting horses to, to do jobs like um, – it makes them more settled in their field of um, – in their hacking or their show jumping. But often they only do the thing that they're meant to do, but they need jobs to do at other yeah. times. And change okay. it up a bit, you know, change it up to make it – imagine eating the same thing all the time. Yeah, so good general outline. Is that your philosophy or can you sum up your philosophy with horses just into a message? Um. Well, I think let the horse be a horse sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, let it be a horse. Let it be in a little herd. Let it have its doona rugs off and, and be out in the rain for a minute. Like, let it be a horse and rub another horse, you know? They're a herd animal, you know? Find it a friend that it can stand next to in the stable and just scratch each other rather than be isolated in in boxes so they don't get hurt, you know. Let them be horses sometimes, I think. And, you know, that's what, yeah, that's what I think, um, that's what I think I like to see sometimes is horses just being allowed to be horses. Yeah. Because they do yeah. so much for us. And yes. most of the time they're only being rugged, you know, with six rugs because we want to blue, win the blue ribbon. And that's, that's, it's not worth it. The horse needs to be comfortable, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. She's doing so much for us, so... Yeah. Sky, what about um, people contacting you? What's the best way for that? I think email is probably good. Okay. And I have a website called um, Sky's the Limit. That's a good name. And Yeah, and it's just, it's just a horse website, so it'll only have stuff on there to do with horses. Is that skiesthelimit.com? Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's a Facebook... Oh, Facebook, yes. Yeah, it's Facebook, Sky's the Limit. And I guess my email is good as well, so yep. skywonzi at gmail.com. Okay. Or they can just call me. I mean, if they're having a problem with horses, you know, sometimes you can just call me and I can just, you know, they may not need to even bring the horse to me. They might just be able to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they might be able to tell me what it's doing and then I can maybe say, you know, well, try this. Yeah, yeah. 
you know. All right. That's great, Sky. And Sky, I'd like to get you back if we can come back another time and talk in a little bit more detail. That'd be great. Fabulous. So, yeah, thanks for your time today. Thank you. See you yeah. later. Thanks okay. a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 